Kate is trying to come in. All right. We are live and getting a last minute call from Kate here. Um, what a wonderful noise. All right. Hi, um, Kate, if you're out there, <laughs> hang up. Um, welcome to this uh, this awesome Google Hangout. Uh, we I, I'm talking. Uh, I'm Joe Hanson, by the way. I'm host of PBS Digital Studios. It's okay to be smart. And uh, today I'm joined by Kelly Levin from the World Resources Institute, and we're going to be uh, talking about a really hot topic. Um, running through some big issues in climate science as we speak. There is a uh, there's a huge climate conference happening in Paris uh, that 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 you might have heard a little bit about if you've been watching the news. Uh, some people have called this the most important issue of our time, uh, a moral crisis, uh, something that affects every human being on Earth. And today, our goal, I think, is uh, to 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 clear up a, a few of the facts, find out what the big issues are, and find out what's going on in Paris. So, uh, Kelly, thanks for joining me. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Um, so yeah, this we're, they're calling this COP twenty one. Um, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about what that is and 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 what these nations are trying to accomplish in Paris? Yeah, so, okay, so parties from all, all over the world, leaders from all around, all around the world, coming to put, put together a new climate change agreement, and they're, and looking, they're looking to how to collectively come on a low carbon trajectory. Um, for the future, um, and that means how are countries going to collectively reduce emissions together? How are they going to um, adapt to climate change and support those that are most vulnerable? How are they going to provide support uh, for developing countries um, that need help to be able to make this transition? And countries have been using working for years to come to this agreement. Um, they've been negotiating the details, and here we are in Paris. Um, the critical moment at which we're coming together uh, to put this agreement down on paper and hammer out the details um, in the next few days of what hopefully will be a really new wave of climate governance, of how the world works together um, to solve, uh, as you said, uh, the most important problem of our time. So this, yeah, this, <laughs> I'm sure there's a lot of coffee being consumed, a lot of late nights, but a lot of people, I think, uh, had an, have an idea that this is all being banged out in this in this few days. Well, like you said, this is something that's that's been going on for years as, as people try to lead up to this. So, what is at stake uh, in in, the, in these talks? I mean, this it's a very short period of time, but I think it, it's something that that could impact uh, that will impact you know the the next centuries of of human existence. What's at stake here? Yeah, so, I mean, really the, the future of our planet and every community on Earth um, is at stake here. Already we've seen, um, as the IPCC report said, widespread and consequential impacts on every single continent in the world. And um, that's only with um, a bit of warming so far. And the trajectory that we're headed for um, is possibly um, three plus degrees of warming over pre-industrial times. And if you think about a uh, civilization has flourished in this very narrow ba band of temperature change. Um, and we have never seen anything like this um, in um, hundreds of thousands of years. And what's at stake is if warming gets above two degrees Celsius, for example, um, above pre-industrial levels, we'll see um, much more glacial melt um, runoff of Big, big rivers um, change either, um, you know, in a way that the runoff is much more declined or increased, leading to flooding. We'll see changes in extreme events, both the uh, frequency as well as the severity. Um, we will see um, the possibility of um, reaching over tipping points, say, in ecosystems. For example, if you think about the Amazon um, forest, where a tipping point, if you had massive die-off of the Amazon, would lead to those trees not being able to sequester carbon anymore, which would have runaway climate change effects. So these are very, very significant impacts, and basically what the world is trying to come together is to get ourselves on a trajectory that we're going to avoid some of these worst climate change impacts. Right. So you, yeah. This. A lot, I want to come back to some of these. Uh, these are all things that we talk about in the future. Um, but I want to come back in a minute to talk about some of the things that are maybe a little more current. But you also mentioned this trajectory that, where what we're doing now, if it was 
you know, business as usual is just three plus degrees, but there's been this other magic number that's been thrown around, which is two degrees Celsius, and I think actually the proposals that are going around have, have maybe re dropped that by a half degree, right. so 1.5 degrees Celsius. So what is that 1.5 degree? What is that two degree? I mean, at the end of the day, there is no safe climate change limit, and this is um, not something that science has um, told us. It's something, uh, it's really a political question, and it's a question about acceptable levels of risk. And when you think about even 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming, which is a global average warming, that's going to be distributed very, very differently depending on where you are and depending on um, your um, need to depend upon natural resources and the extent to which you're going to get impacted. Um, we have talked in the negotiations around limiting warming to no more than two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels, but still that brings um, significant consequences to communities around the world, sea level rise, extreme events, um, we've already seen crop damages, die off of trees, um, and when you think about the future of some small islands, for example, uh, it is too much warming, uh, and uh, that's why many have been advocating, and there's a climate vulnerable forum at the negotiations which have been adv advocating for 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming. Now, we are not on that trajectory right now, and even with climate change commitments that countries have put forward for after 2020, um, we are taking something that would have been four or five degrees of warming down to three or so degrees of warming, um, but we're not close to two degrees warming, let alone 1.5 degrees of warming. So it means peaking emissions very, very soon um, in the next few years globally, um, and then rapidly declining them afterwards to eventually phase them out all together at the end of the century. Well, that's a that is a hefty goal. It's something that almost seems unimaginable now. But um, you know, I, the one thing I think people don't don't get is that even if we stopped emissions today, uh, we've seen a little bit of warming, but but we would still see a continued uh, warming. Um, you mentioned islands, and there has been a specific case that's been that's been coming up in the news around Paris, which is the Marshall Islands, and uh, talking about impacts that even if we did this one and a half degrees, two degrees, that are areas like that, uh, maybe you can tell us a little about what the people from the Marshall Islands have been doing there. Yeah, I mean, at, a question, at the end of the day, there are going to be some um, impacts to climate change that you're, we're not going to be able to adapt to. Um, and certainly those get bigger and bigger as temperature rises, but um, something like a low-lying population which can't live where it's meant to live um, and is forced to migrate somewhere else, um, this is a question um, of a climate change impact that's irreversible. And you can think about species loss the same way. Um, and uh, this is a uh, tremendous, tremendous implications for um, the most vulnerable communities around the world, um, as well as some system changes that we could never ever reverse. Uh, so it's a question of um, how do we actually make sure that we get on a pathway to make sure that those changes are limited um, and that we support those that are most vulnerable um, that are going to be, uh, their identity literally will be washed away with the climate change impacts. That's, and that's, I mean, it's hard to think of a more, of a higher impact. I mean, you're talking about, yeah, the, the sort of the eradication of, a, of, a, of an entire culture. I think, you know, most of us can't really even imagine a, a home washing away, but literally the entire place in which you live, it's, it's, it's completely unreal. Um, but I think there are things that are happening at home because of climate. Again, we think of these sort of like distant things like Antarctica or Greenland or, you know, uh, you know Africa becoming warmer. We think of these things happening very far away. Uh, but can you, can you talk a bit about things that people might see where they live in, you know, in cities and in, in, in uh, inland? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, already with the impacts of climate change that we've already had, um, 0.8 degrees Celsius warming or so, um, we've already seen um, significant heat waves and we can think in our communities around some of those um, those changes. We've seen significant tree dieback. Um, we've seen changes in frequency and severity of storms in line with projected um, changes. Um, and while it's hard to kind of pinpoint any one extreme event um, and say that is due to climate change, we are changing the odds and basically things that used to be, say, a hundred-year storm are becoming much, much more frequent. Um, and there's actually been a lot, of, a lot of science in terms of the attribution of climate change um, to extreme events. Um, but we're already seeing this um, unfold in our backyards, for example, with changes um, in the timing of spring. 
um, and when that comes, um, and when birds arrive, and what we can plant in our gardens at a certain point in time, um, which wouldn't have been thought of, uh, you know, even two decades ago. Uh, so we're starting to see those changes unfold um, in every single community around the world. So yeah, I mean, birds, uh, species like these, have have evolved their patterns and their behaviors over hundreds of thousands to millions of years, and we're we're sort of asking them to adjust on a very short time scale. Do you, do you think? Do you think it's possible? It depends on the species. Um, so there are actually, you know, there are a few species that will benefit from a from a ch climate change, but the large majority um, will not. And um, there are confounding factors here. It's not only the rate of change, which is completely unprecedented. So um, even though uh, species have adjusted over time to changes. Um, in our climate, we have never seen such a rate of change. And the second thing that's very challenging is we have completely disrupted the landscape. Uh, so um, a lot of um, what's projected in a changing climate is not only the changes in timing of species, so when birds arrive, for example, but it's also what are the viable habitats for species to live in. Um, so where is precipitation and temperature just right? What is that perfect little niche for that particular species? Um, and in an ideal world, species would have time to migrate, but they also would have room and space to migrate. But now we've created, you know, in the best case scenarios, these national parks that are delineated by some kind of boundary. Um, and right outside that boundary is a complete massive amount of development. Um, so the um, migratory pathways of some species uh, just don't even exist. Um, and then you think about some species that have um, no, no chance. Um, you think about a mountain pika, um, and in mountains, uh, species are going to be migrating upwards in elevation, but the mountain pika sits right at the top of that mountain, and the question is, where is it going to go? Um, it can't pop itself off the mountain, um, and there are some species that um, really have no viable habitat to be able to get to. So there's a question of, of which nations um, sort of bear responsibility in, these, in, this, in, this, in this great grand global issue. Uh, obviously, industrialized nations like the U.S. Uh, and, and, and much of Europe have been at the forefront of emissions. We put a lot of carbon in the air. Um, but there are other nations that are catching up quickly. So how is this, how is this weighing out about who, who's being asked to take responsibility? That is the, the, the question at the negotiations, um, and it's about um, a question of um, how do we solve this problem and how do we also facilitate um, those countries that need additional resources to be able to solve this problem. Um, at the end of the day, um, developed countries have to lead, um, and uh, the um, historical responsibility um, and emissions um, that we've gotten into this mess in the first place um, are because of uh, a very dirty pathways towards industrialization. And uh, developed countries definitely acknowledge that they do have to lead. Um, at the same time, and if you look, the Global Carbon Project um, just put out a report um, looking at trends in carbon dioxide emissions. Um, and whereas the, the bulk percentage of global emissions were from developed countries, um, now it is um, a minority. Um, and where um, major emitters uh, such as China and India um, and um, Indonesia, uh, South Africa, Mexico, um, what have you, we can't actually solve this problem with just um, a handful of emitters. Uh, so this is truly a global problem. Um, also because um, we also need to think about adaptation and those that are most vulnerable. Um, so a lot of the conversation um, about um, who's responsible and support um, is not only for supporting countries to be able to get on a um, low carbon trajectory in terms of mitigation and technologies that will uh, phase out emissions over time, but also how to support those most vulnerable to adapt to climate change impacts. So it's one thing to talk about what nations should do, and at this very high level, and uh, you know, public policy and 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 government initiatives. But what about? I think a lot of people feel like they're rather powerless in this case. They don't feel like their their daily choices make much difference. But uh, how how much of this is is on that top level of government policies, and and what is what can an individual do in their daily life? Yeah. So, I mean, there, there still is a lot that um, individuals can do um, to make um, themselves uh, have low emitting behavior. Um, one of the, the biggest um, source of individual emissions is air, airfare, air, air, 
air carrier. Um, and the extent to which um, folks can limit air travel um, or at least take direct flights um, can actually, if you look at your carbon footprint, if you're um, somebody who travels by air a lot, uh, that's probably um, a significant percentage of it. Um, also, um, some households are um, have the option to be able to have renewable energy um, source their electricity, um, which is something um, certainly to be uh, very supportive of. Um, but at the end of the day, um, we need massive policy change. And um, one of the biggest things that um, folks can do just as voters um, and as people who can get the word out um, is really try to influence um, the um, politics. Um, and we see in the United States, for example, all of the talk is about um, the upcoming presidential election um, and injecting climate change into those discussions to make sure that it is uh, front and center um, in um, discussions, um, as well as trying to um, make sure that those um, who get into office are supportive of significant policy change um, and doing a lot of action on climate change. Uh, so uh, the, the biggest power that any individual has is a voter um, and getting the word out about how this needs to be uh, um, one of the key issues uh, that politicians should be talking about. We should fight the, that, that cynicism ever, that says that you don't have, that you can't make a difference. Yeah, that, that your vote still can make a difference. Um, so there, in, in I cover climate a lot, and you know, obviously we, we, we live in this world and read all the stories, and much of it seems very sort of foreboding and frightening and sort of doom uh, inspired, and it is a serious issue and something that has a lot of possible negative consequences. But is there anywhere that we're succeeding that we can sort of find positives in this? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're starting to see policy unfolding around the globe. I mean, you can see even in the U.S. Um, with the Clean Power Plan, where we've had um, uh, restrictions put on um, power plants and carbon dioxide emissions, with states having the flexibility to design their own plan. But we're seeing renewable energy targets throughout the world. Um, we're starting to see energy efficiency standards, um, certification and labels. Um, we're seeing uh, changes in um, land sector policies um, and curbing of deforestation. Um, and one of the most promising things before Paris is that we have over 180 countries submitting um, INDCs, or Intended Nationally Determined Contributions. And these are climate change action plans after 2020. Um, and countries um, are becoming very, very serious about what they can do um, to solve climate change. And they've had um, domestic conversations about this. They have submitted this for international recognition. Um, and in the absence of the Paris Agreement, we would not have seen this flurry of action happening all over. Um, but there is so much going on, and I think there's um, a lot of reason um, to think that uh, this momentum is just going to continue to grow and grow if the agreement sends the right policy signals. So a lot of this, uh, the discussion around, around climate change has talked about of course, ceasing emissions or limiting emissions very quickly, um, but there I, that that might not be enough. Uh, what about taking carbon out of the air? This seems to be something that that most a lot, that many people find necessary. Um, can you give us an idea of, of of what our what our realistic goals might be? You know, just emissions versus having to take some of this out. Yeah, so I think there are a few few different ways to think about this. Um, there is enhanced sequestration, so you can think, for example. Um, in um, a simple way about um, reforesting um, land, degraded land, for example. And if you think about the tremendous opportunity that exists with, um, you know, hectares and hectares and hectares all around the world of degraded land where nothing can really grow. Um, and if we were to be able to reforest that um, significant potential for um, uh, sequestration of carbon. Um, and at the same time, there is this discussion of quote unquote negative emissions. Um, and basically, this is combining bioenergy um, with carbon capture and storage. Um, and a lot of the models, if you get into the weeds of them, um, to get to the two degree scenario or even the 1.5 degree scenario, rely on what is called negative emissions. Um, we have never had negative emissions proven at the scale that is required by these models. Um, so it's, um, there's a significant uncertainty around it. And uh, I, I think it's a call um, for as great emission reductions as we can possibly do in the near term so that we don't have um, any kind of need to rely on significant amounts of negative emissions in the future since uh, it's a big gamble and we don't have you know, a plan B um, after uh, we find that, uh, you know, for whatever 
um, reasons, whether or not it's water availability or land availability, um, that we just can't actually uh, produce the amount of negative emissions that's necessary. So the uh, this is not the first time that there have been international climate talks, of course. Uh, right. If, if you can take the temperature there in Paris, like what is different about this versus climate talks in the past versus you know, Kyoto and, and Copenhagen and, and things, places where this has happened before? Yeah, no, it's, it's a great question. I mean, I, I think that we're in a very, very different place. Um, I think, um, for one, we have heads of state that are listening. Um, and if you look at the, the first day was opening with heads of state making announcements and just the sheer number of heads of state that um, came um, in the United States, we have um, President Obama, who's trying to make this um, his legacy. Um, we have the U.S. and China agreeing together, um, which is truly unprecedented. The fact that they came forward um, and put together their um, post-2020 climate strategy together. We have commitments from some of the largest countries to actually peak their emissions and decline afterwards. And this is not just slowing the growth of emissions, but also just actually um, declining emissions. Um, we have um, much uh, greater renewable energy um, production than ever before. Um, and we have some renewable energy um, sources that are um, have declined so much in price that they're actually cost competitive in some locations. Um, and I think climate change impacts, for better or worse, are continuing to unfold um, all over the world. So there continues to be, you know, significant public awareness and um, much more engagement. And I think that um, we n now also have, you know, significant climate change action plans that countries have put forward um, in advance of the Paris Agreement. So uh, just a huge amount of momentum um, and a very um, different process um, in Paris to come to the agreement, which is, you know, very, very transparent. Um, that have, as I said, you know, it's been years in the making. Uh, so um, I think that countries are, are very much on board to try to find a solution in the next few days. That's that's uh, I think an optimistic look. Um, and speaking of optimism, there was I came across a column by by Bjorn Lomberg this week, who has been a questionable <laughs> uh, uh, supporter of of climate policies in the past, to to say the least, um, who essentially said that. No matter analysis of this, no matter what we do, this is all a dream. This will never work. We can't. We can't avoid what's going to happen. Um, no matter what we do in Paris, um, very pessimistic take. So where where do you where do you see yourself, and where do you see the other people there in Paris versus pessimism versus optimism? Yeah, I mean, I I, I think everybody is, is if you're in Paris is, is probably a cautious optimist because you've um, you're really invested in solutions and um, I I don't buy the argument that this is meaningless and in the absence of uh, the Paris Agreement we would never see 180 plus countries come forward with their climate action plans um, we would never see heads of state um, one by one making commitments and talking about how climate change is one of the greatest uh, challenges of our time um, and. Uh, this is, um, th there's really the potential to have a long-term um, way of cooperation through this agreement that countries are repeatedly going to come back to the table, um, increase their ambition, um, and work together to solve this. Now, at the end of the day, um, you know, th the reason I would say is cautious is we still need to understand um, and be guided by the scale of the problem. Um, and there's a tremendous emissions gap between uh, limiting warming to two or 1.5 degrees and where we're headed right now. So uh, there's, there's a huge amount of work um, to be done, not only to implement what countries have already committed to, but also to figure out how we increase the ambition to actually avoid some of the worst climate change impacts. So this sounds like a first step, hopefully, in, uh, in, a, in a long, long journey uh, that we're all going to have to take. And hopefully people will keep coming back to the table. But uh, we'll certainly be following along. Uh, the rest, the rest of this conference, to see what those drafts look like, and and uh, and hopefully we can all commit to making this, uh, to making these changes. Yeah. Well, uh, thanks, thanks for joining us. It's been an amazing conversation, um, and uh, we'll we'll definitely be following up in the comments below this. I think there there should be some some really good conversations. I hope coming out of this around the world. So, uh, Kelly, thank you very much. No, thank you so much. Great to chat. You too, and have fun in Paris. Thank you. <laughs> all right.